I'd like to welcome everyone to this 2022 Data Science Hackathon. This is the third hackathon that Minisa is running this year with the team Data Science. First, we'd like to thank our organizing team, uh, Prof. Sana, based at UJ, and uh, Victoria Dao, based at Minisa. We'd also like to thank our MMPH team who are helping us with uh, the technical parts of organizing this uh, event. And also we want to thank our organizers, uh, Microsoft, CETA, and also GIZ, who have sponsored some part of these um, events. And also we are hoping that you will learn a lot from uh, this hackathon. Uh, from the team that will be running the Python uh, today up until we, uh, this day, it is led by uh, Prop Today from UJ. Uh, joined by three ladies, uh, who is Kaiso Macho. Kaiso Macho is a demonstrator and also a software, uh, software developer with experience on three large software projects across different domains. She has also implemented many algorithms with um, Python. We also have from Pro Sephora, who is also a demonstrator and an instructor. Pro is a game developer with experience in several programming languages and tools. She is highly proficient with Python programming language and has experience in teaching uh, Python. Lastly, we are joined with Gamohelo Seisa, uh, who is also a demonstrator and an instructor. Gamohelo is a software developer with also experience in creating applications, software and accounting. She's also very fluent in Python programming language. It's very exciting to see ladies or women taking uh, part or participating in the uh, center, which is mostly um, dominated by men. I will hand over to Kahiso, uh, who will take us through the session. Thank you so much for joining. Hope you enjoy the three sessions. Thanks. Kahiso, uh, over to you. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. Um, I'm just, we're just going to start with Prof. Um, Jide with the introduction. Hello everybody, I hope everybody's doing well. Sorry for the delay. Um, the Zoom meeting on my calendar for this event was for the Power BI, so I kind of ended up in the wrong uh, Zoom meeting. Um, you're welcome, everyone. Um, this should be fun. The whole idea is to have fun, kind of like going through what Python is, starting everything from the scratch. It's a beginner's course, so if you are very advanced in this whole thing, you probably should be taking Weka or Power BI as you speak. But if you know that you don't know much about programming, this is the right place to be, and you are in the right place. Um, software developer. All right, a software developer. Masin, what's up? I see you there. Hello. A software developer, what else? Uh, an academic, if you're like me. Um, someone is looking, someone is just a student who is looking at getting into the space, getting to win and, and have the skill sets and all of that. So in the chat window, guys, please, let's engage. Let's go. I'm going to put my own. I'm an academic, all right? So I've typed mine. Uh, please just get in there, everyone. Let's know what your role is or what where you hold in society. What are, what are you hoping to become? Yeah, let's go. Waiting. Coding and learning algorithms, that's Aaron, okay? Public analyst, okay, municipality. Oh, color, okay, that's that's cool. Uh, the municipalities is where there is so much applications that is possible, you know. There are many issues that can be solved to technology in that space. Software developer UKZN, thank you very much, Raj. Raj, nice to nice to have you here. Hi, Prof. Good to be here. Yeah, salute. Uh Muzi is saying I'm a student hoping to get into the space. Okay, Muzi, nice to have you here. Okay, Alan Waju, part time academic, software consultant, and technopreneur. Okay, aspiring AI expert. Yeah, yeah, Larry, I know you also from a background in chemical engineering. Nice to have you here as always. 
educator, Koketo, let us know. Is it at uh, university level? What do you teach? If you haven't typed anything yet, please type something. Jonathan, I'm waiting for you. And Hugo, let's go. Don't, don't, don't be hard to get. Israel, what's up? Okay, I see from Umpo. Umpo is saying I'm an IT student studying towards becoming a Java and c -sharp developer. That's fantastic. Umpo, the magic is about algorithms. The languages you would master every one of them, uh, depending on the projects you find yourself on. So that wouldn't be a problem. Okay, for Robert's coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember Jonathan mentioned something about that. Yeah, I remember, I remember, yeah. High school editing, fantastic, teaching history. Woo, all the way from history, Koketo, that's very impressive. History to IT, that's some jump. That's fantastic, impressive stuff. All right, Hugo, educator for high school student training. Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, for the guys in high school, who knows? You can drop me an email if you want to invite me for something in your school. You and I can run some little thing together, like some very pro bono stuff. Just inspire those young lads to get out of their, you know, young students, uh, um, everyone there to tell them this is what the direction of the world is going, you know, technology and stuff like that. Can have many conversations, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Katie Boni says, master student in algorithms. I've got AI algorithms under your supervision. Oh, okay, then that's Peter, that's Peter, Peter. Oh, of course, Peter, I know you, man. That's sarcastic. Uh, college lecturer, chemical engineering, impressive. So, Katie, Katie, can I see you? Let me link you up with Larry right now, because both of you guys are in, in chemical engineering, right? Katie, can I see you? Let me link you up right now. Let me get you a collaborator right now. IT speaker, consultant, and network engineer. Okay, Israel. I see you there, Israel. Okay, Muzi, what's up? I see Muzi there. Salute. You're already in each other. Oh, we're back in time. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, you got me there, all right? Because chemical -Kem engineering kind of like just packed it for me that. Larry is the guy that I know in Kim Kanjan. All right, folks, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Um, let's have some fun. It's the last day. I, I, I hate goodbyes, but then uh, it is what it is, you know. But then goodbye in this context doesn't mean goodbye. So uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, and my uh, co-facilitators here are also available, all of them on LinkedIn. And we can keep sharing content. Yeah, it's never really goodbye, especially in the space. You're always gonna, Hugo, I agree with you. You're always gonna cross paths and, and something's gonna happen soon. All right, so I'm just opening um, what I want to chat to you guys about. All right, so um, first I'm going to just drop my LinkedIn uh, um, page URL. So you can, you can follow me on LinkedIn. You can add me as a connection there. We can chat about random stuff. Uh, if you're busy something, if you're in education, absolutely yes. If you're not, if you're in business, that's also fine. Uh, I have some connections and from business schools to tech entrepreneurship and all those spaces I'm, I'm quite um, kind of all over the place when it comes to application of AI and computation, generally speaking. So today, guys, welcome again. Uh, today, I think we have uh, one hour, 49 minutes now. Today, we are, we are gonna have a lot of fun. First thing we're gonna do is to talk about data structures and algorithms. And I kind of started that talk yesterday. So um, speaking about data structures, again, yesterday I was mentioning that this is how you put data into some memory of some sort. There are two kinds of memory. There's one that's passive, the other one is, um, it is uh, much more, it sticks more. I don't wanna use more technical terms in case you're not a computing expert, all right? So passive memory is you're running a code, the code stops running, we lose everything, like a variable, 
say A equals five, and we're running that piece of code, then the moment that code stops running, A stops being five. We can get it ever again, all right? Then there's persistent memory where we can say within the code, since A is five, let's store it in the file. Let's put it in a database or somewhere out there. And then when the code stops running, we still have access to that, that file, that, that record or that memory, if you like. So the so-called passive memory is always in your RAM because your RAM is running a lot of tasks, a lot of things are happening. Then when the program stops running, it disappears, right? Then the persistent one is always on your hard drive, somewhere there stored, like on your file and your databases and stuff like that. In that case as well, if the program stops running, in fact, you can have five different programs on the same data. That data can be a spreadsheet, a text document, uh, a database or, or cloud infrastructure somewhere with some huge five databases, each of them containing 40 tables. It can be anywhere. That's what I'm trying to say. So the picture can be bigger, all right? However, the length of your code sometimes depends on how you store the code itself, all right? How you store the data itself, not the code, the data itself. So if you write a piece of code to access data and the data is not well stored, then we're in, we're in problem, we're in a huge problem. Because then when you read the data, then you have to do some pre-processing first before you can begin your own algorithm, all right? So if you want to make your life a lot easy, store your data very well, make sure it's accessible, then your code is shorter sometimes and even the logic is less complex. So you can eliminate, eliminate something called pre-processing. And recently in AI, in machine learning recently, there's been this movement towards good data set. Because algorithms are already good. Trust me, most of the algorithms that are shining today are not shining because they are new. They're shining because there are machines that can actually process them, all right? We call them high performance computers, computers that can run for all days, all nights and get results. But then logistic regression has been around for a long time. Many algorithms have been around for a long time. Problem is there was no machines to execute some of these algorithms. And also the data you get skews your view of the world. So let's say you are mining data from the web and the data says, every time I see a doctor or an engineer, the female version I see is always homemakers, like a homemaker, all right? Then that data is skewed already because we're trying to move away from that mindset where women just have to be homemakers. You know what I'm saying? So in that context, for example, if you train a model on that data set, anytime you give it a male dominated role, like a governor, uh, a soldier or something, and you say, predict for me what is the female equivalent, it's gonna give you a homemaker. Whereas you and I know there are women fighting wars in, in, in Baghdad or something, you know what I'm saying? So now, now that's very skewed. So bottom line, data in its entirety is the juice of prediction, juice of AI, juice of machine learning. If the data is really messed up, you might not actually be getting much out of what you're trying to do. It could be frustrating as well. So if you're on LinkedIn, kind of follow the groups on LinkedIn that have uh, machine learning groups and AI groups. So you see them talk about data, quality of data. They talk about this a lot because your algorithm, I can use the same algorithm as you and I get better results than you do because of the quality of the data set we have. Things like missing data, for example, should you remove it or should you have an algorithm that puts something back into the missing cell, like an average value? So. Those are the topics that come up at some level of the game. However, today, we just want, I just wanna talk about data sets and data structures. So data sets is the actual data and there are many websites you can get free data sets from. Uh, again, I always like to show uh, my folks uh, about Google data set. Uh, let me just see if I can show that real quick. So, um, I'm gonna quickly share my screen now and show you guys a, lot, uh, a little bit about Google data set. And then from that point, I uh, will then talk about data structures a little bit and I give the control again to the soldiers that are going to fire away. All right. So let's say you, most of you are already contemplating or already into data science. Let's say you just want this data to predict on, to do some magic on. 
Here is a website where you can get data for almost anything, right? You can type into this box COVID. You can put HIV here, road accidents. Uh, you can put uh, education data set or dropout rates data, programming module difficulty data. Everything is here. Google did a great job to, to put this in. So if I went for COVID first, so I can see COVID test samples in India. So 2020, when I click that, I'm gonna have access to a lot. And they come in all formats. So I can get like this one, explore this from this website. They come sometimes in Excel spreadsheet, sometimes in CSV files and all of those things. Uh, if I went for something like, um, let's say HIV, HIV, um, that rate, 1987 to 2018 by gender. That's a useful data set in case you want to predict something, right? Uh, that rate HIV in Canada, that's something else. If you keep reading down, you see a lot of data sets that you can actually play around with, all right? Especially when you start mastering your data science, you're already on, uh, your Python is looking good, your work as whatever you're using is looking good. So if I say by gender, I see this one over here, I can click it. Then it's gonna link, uh, link me to the website where I can get the data set. Oh, and I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna see PDF, Excel, PNG, that's just picture PowerPoint. But naturally, you know, we like Excel, Excel is better. This one doesn't look like it's free, but mostly they are always free. Um, so this is just a way you can search for data, uh, but with data set. Um, that said, I'm gonna get back. I said to you, so today the whole idea is to go through uh, data structures and not everything. So this, there are many kinds of data structures. You have things from queues to, um, uh, to arrays, to uh, objects and, and list of objects, to uh, list normal programming languages, to dictionaries, the list just goes on, all right? Today, we're just only gonna look at lists and dictionaries. Why that choice? For lists, it's easy because uh, anytime we want to do uh, some machine learning or some, uh, some kind of data science or some data set, just want to find out some insights on the data, we actually have to read the data from any format, maybe CSV, maybe Excel, straight back into where we can use it, into the code. And in the code, we put in a list or a list of lists, which um, I think Camo and uh, Kakiso will show you. The form poor actually. He shows you a data science example of some data science algorithms and stuff. So you have the list. List is just an arrangement of items. It could be string items, could be numerical items, could be floating point items, just the arrangement, that is the list that you have. Then dictionary is indexed, meaning that you can say, my name is this, in my case, is that's Abejide. My name is Abejide, then you can have other things, university, University of Johannesburg, whatever, 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 cell phone number, da, da, da. So that there is a dictionary. They are what you call a tuple. A tuple is immutable, meaning that it doesn't change. The value of a tuple can never change. So what do you like to store in a data structure like a tuple? Things that don't change, like vowels, you know? Vowels don't change. Consonants in English don't change. So those kind of things that never change, instead of storing them in something where you have to manage the memory, you can start in a fixed structure like a topo. So today we're going to touch on those things, a few of those things. And then we would uh, look at examples and it should be fun. Questions before I allow these guys to take it away? Questions? Anyone? No questions. So the structure would be that Camo would get started with a list and examples with every, every one of you. Again, I'll be in the chat window just there responding to your, to your questions. We're gonna talk about topos, uh, dictionaries, and list of lists, which is like a two-dimensional array. If you have some mathematical background, that's like a matrix. Um, then Kamo will tell us about some functions, uh, use of functions, how to create a function, very simple example. Then Kaki, we kick in with uh, some examples. Examples, she's gonna write a bunch of code lines for us. Then towards the end comes the magic from Umpo, where Umpo is gonna tell you about some libraries in data science, Python libraries like NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, 
Matplot library and, and all of the Skitlearn and all of those libraries, then she will end with an example of regression analysis and prediction. Um, Paul, what are you going to be predicting today? Um, Paul? Um, me predicting the likelihood of a person buying insurance. Yeah, yeah. So that's a very fantastic, that's a fantastic example, if you ask me. And the good thing is that when this is all done, then we have this little chat before it all ends. I'll give you my blessings for the hackathon. I hope you win it because 10% of that money is mine when you do. Uh, I know we don't have an agreement prior to now, but you can be so graceful to look at UG and donate some money to us in my research lab. All right, folks, lock and load. We're ready. Any questions? Going once, going twice? Nope. Okay, let's get started. Camo, over to you. Take it away. Okay. So um, today we'll be looking at lists, tuples, dictionaries, lists of lists, and an example of a square function. With regards to tuples, we're just going to be looking at a simple example because they are immutable, meaning that you cannot edit the data. So let's move to our first examples. Just to touch on what Prof said, lists are used to store multiple items in one variable. They are mutable, meaning that elements can be changed or edited, removed and replaced. And the main thing is that they are indicated with square brackets. So um, in our first example, we're going to create a list of strings. Um, let's create a list of provinces. And then we're just going to assign some provinces, enter some provinces into the list for now, for our first example. Let's have Gauteng and Popo. And and maybe Northwest. So we've just created a list of provinces with um, four different items in it. It's a list of strings. And as I said, it's a list is indicated with square brackets. So we have Gauteng, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, and Northwest. So how do we print a list? We just print and then the name of the list itself. So there we go. There is our list printed out as it is there. Um, in our second example, we're just going to create a list of integers and print it as well. And then we're going to build on from there. So let's just have random ages. And we have 29, 5, 67 just a short little list and then you can print it just to see how the output how the output looks like so there we go we have our first list which was a list of strings over there each item is separated by a, com uh, a comma and then we have our list of integers which is also separated by a comma so now we need to build on that and what happens when we don't want to manually enter this, when we want to prompt the user to enter um, items into the list? So um, for the first example, we're gonna have a predefined list length. So let's just have a list length of three. The first thing you need to do is to create uh, provinces need to create an empty list. So an empty list allows us to add um, data by ourselves into the list. And that is what we're going to do in this example. So because we want to add multiple types, multiple um, pieces of data into the list, the best thing we can do is a for loop. So for I in provinces, for example. 
and then we are going sorry not for i in provinces for i in range and then we have three so basically what we are doing in this for loop is we are making a for loop that goes three times we're first starting with a predefined number of data pieces in our list so let's just set off for three just now and then we'll modify it to taking in the input for the number of data items. So in this case, we are going to take in the user input as user prov for user province. And we are taking in a string data type, meaning that we don't need to, um, we don't need to change the data as because it's when it's inputted by the user, it is already a string. So enter a province. Um, we prompt the user to enter a province, and then we are going to access the list itself. And then we're gonna put a dot, and we're going to use append to add the item that the user has entered to the list. So here we are adding the user input to the list. That is what a pin does. And then um, we can also print our output so that we can see what we have. Okay. Um, clear this. So let's enter a province. Let's go with Western Cape. Then Cape and uh, Northern Cape. So there we have our list of Western Cape, Eastern Cape, and Northern Cape. Um, we have three provinces. The most important thing to note with list is that they are zero indexed, meaning that um, the item number, this would be zero, the index of this would be zero, the index of this would be one, and the index of this would be two, meaning that there are three items, but because it starts from zero, the three in the range is excluded. Um, so if you were to access the third item, it would be the index of two, which is Northern, Northern Cape, but we'll get into that in just a few. So now we need to use the user input and um, read in an in value so that we can use it to determine the amount of data that we want in the list. So we can do that by creating an in, and then we have input, and we have and prompt the user to enter in, in being the number of provinces to be paid. So in controls, in is going to control the amount of times that this for loop is going to run. So for the sake of this example, let's say two, because we had three the previous time, and we can say Limpopo and um, Malanga. And there we go. We have our user input list, and that is how you can enter data into the list yourself. Now, um, Sometimes we need to iterate through a list. How would we do that? So for this example, I'm just going to copy this list over here so that we can work from that. How do we iterate through a list? We're going to use for prov in provinces. So another for loop. What does this mean? Prov is um, each, it's the variable name for each data item in the list. So in this case, we 
you named it prof. So it can be I, you can use any um, data name that is relevant to the list that you're working with. So I didn't wanna use the word province because it's similar to provinces and that might cause a bit of confusion. So we're just gonna say for prov in provinces, this is the list. So we're accessing each item in the list. So, yeah, this. we are going to try to print each item in the list in a column format, meaning one underneath each other. So we are expecting the word Gauteng, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, and Northwest each underneath each other. So when we run that, that is what we Gauteng, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, and Northwest all underneath each other. But when you want to um, print them on the same line, you can use this end function with the space over there. And we will have our list on the same line. So now what happens when you want to replace an element in the list? You can say um, uh, provinces. So now we're going to implement the indexes. So let's replace Limpopo with something else. So let's, um, because we are working with indexes, this is zero, this is one, this is two, and this is three. Meaning that we want to place, oh, okay. This will be the name of the list itself. And then you're going to have square brackets and an integer that we, um, represents the index of the um, element you would like to change. So we want to change the purple. That would mean that the integer we would use is one. And then we can replace it with something like, something that isn't a, a name of a province just to um, show the chain. So this is our original list as we have seen it here. So I'm going to run this. Our expected output is going to be Houting, Apple, Mpumalanga, North. And there we go. That is how you would replace the list. And then we would need, uh, when we want to remove an element in the list, um, we can say, provinces dot, I think there's a raised hand. Uh, Jonathan, can you speak? Yeah, I, sorry. I just want to know the um, the way that you've changed item one in the list now. Can we then, after the equals, add a user input? Um, after which equals? So you, you said, yeah, provinces with one equals apple. Can we replace Apple with a user input there? Oh yes, you definitely can. You can read the input for the, for the from the user. Yeah, for that specific province. Yes. Okay. To change that element. So let's just try um, what Jonathan was doing. That's a great question, uh, Jonathan. Yeah. The inputs don't have to be hard coded every time. It could be read from the keyboard, from the user. You know what I'm saying? That's a good question. And we're going to have province and one. And then we're going to replace it with them. Um, so yeah. So please enter provinces. Let's enter Limpopo again. Oh no, we can't because we're trying to replace that. So let's enter Eastern. Oranges. Oranges as up. Yes. Okay, oranges. There we go. How thing oranges to Malanga in Northwest. So it is possible and you can do that. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I think I was on being elements in a list. So when we want to remove elements in a list, uh, 
and we can remove, for example, housing. Oh, yes. the name province. There we go. So we have Limpopo, Mpumalanga, and both West. So that is how you would iterate through the list, a for loop and a variable name, and then the list itself, and you print the variable name. Um, you can print it in column form, one underneath each other, or you can print it on the same line, however you want to. Um, iterating through a list also helps with, maybe you want to make changes in the list in each um, province or something like that. You can also replace elements and remove elements. So a list is the most um, like suitable data structure to use because you can change the data. Um, if, if you need to. So now, just a demonstration of a tuple. This is not going to go into detail because it's immutable. You cannot change elements, you cannot remove elements, you can't be replaced. Just like Prof said, um, the, oh, the, the most, the, mo the way you can use a tuple is where the data cannot be changed, something that cannot be changed, for example, like vowels. So in this example, we're going to create a tuple of strings. Um, we're just going to do the provinces. And just to show you the, the structure. So another thing with tuples, we need round brackets instead of instead of um, square brackets. So in lists, we use square brackets and in tuples, we use round brackets. So we will have helping and bubble and those two. So we can print our tuple out. Here we go, we have our first element and our second element. So just to show that you can't really change um, elements in a tuple, I want to us to attempt changing the first province to apples. which we are expecting an error because double object does not support alignment. So you can't change whatever's in there. So just as Prof was saying, it's better to use it with data that changes. Okay, um, going back to lists, we're going to move to list of lists. So basically a list object is where each element in the list is an object, uh, is a list itself, sorry. So in this example, we're just going to use groceries, right? So what we know about groceries is that there's different categories. There's fruits, there's vegetables, there's cleaning detergents, and all of that. So we're going to initialize our list. And then in our list, we can create our first mini list, sub list, I'm going to call it. And then let's have vegetables under this section. So we have spinach and tomatoes. So that is our first list in our big grocery list. But then we separate it by a comma and then can add another list. In this list, let's maybe have meat or something. So we have beef and Lamb. So um, in our grocery list, we now have two sub lists and they are each different category. So um, just to print that out, print out our list of lists. So just um, to print the large list, you're going to put the name of the large 
the, the larger list, which is gross in this case. Uh, oh. Okay, there we go. So there we go. We have our li larger list and our sub list of vegetables and our sub list of inside the grocery. But then what happens if we want to access or print each list separately? We go back to our trusty for loop. So we go for list underscore. Why am I putting an underscore? Anything that is highlighted in blue is a function, a predefined function. So in this case, we're trying to name a variable. So we would just add an underscore for list in days. Then we can print the list. <laughs> okay, there we have our first list of vegetables and our second list of meat. Then what happens now if I want to print all of the elements separately? So then we can introduce another for loop for items in um, list. What are we doing? We are accessing the list, the sub list, and we are accessing the separate items each list. So then we can print items and run it. Uh, oh, yes, indentation error. So we need to tab. So we have a for loop that goes through the, 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 gro the main grocery list. And then we have another for loop that goes through each sub list. And then we are printing each item separately. So we have spinach, tomato, beef, and lamb. So that is a list of items. And then we are going to work with a dictionary. So the example that we're going to be doing under dictionary is um, about car information. So a, diction a dictionary associates a set of keys with data value, right? So your keys are like your categories per se. Uh, and then you have yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt you. From the chat window, uh, some comrades there want to take screenshots mm -hmm. before you move oh, to the next. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did I yeah. go back That's to the first sorry. one? Israel, sorry. Um, let me yeah. go to the first line. She's going to go to first line. I hope you can use your undo and redo again so that you don't miss out on any line of code you've already typed. Um, okay, there's a question from Jonathan as well. Is there a way to print a numbered list? I think what it means about a numbered integer. list. Yeah, a list of integers, I think. So um, the, the, the number of the item in the list. So where you start with zero, uh, to yeah, say zero is it. this item and two is this item and three is this item, something like that. Oh, okay, yes, like yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. And then okay. Camo, when, yes, when you see the, the code is fleshed out and the example is complete, just invite everyone to screen grab before you continue. Okay. Okay, sir. All right. Cool. We'll do. Okay. Um, okay, so which uh <laughs> sorry, where <laughs> comes not go. Let me go back. Which examples would you like to screenshot? Just let me know and then I will go back to them. Um as for as for ad core though. <laughs> well, I, I don't even know what that means, but I know you had though the core part, I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 so um, I think Jonathan asked, can you print an element in a list itself using the index? Yes, you can. How would I do that? Let's just attempt to print in Bumalanga. That index would be two, right? And then you are printing the, the province by itself. There we go. 
So if I were to replace that and say one, we are expecting Limpopo to be printed. And no, I don't think that's what he's meaning. Sorry, just to, I think what he means is um, Gauteng 1, Limpopo 2, Mpumalanga 3, Northwest 4. That if you print it, that it, it says 1 is Gauteng, 2 is Limpopo, 3 is Mpumalanga. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Yes, you can definitely do that. So... I think, Kamo, you can iterate through the list and mm -hmm. start with your index of zero and print index of zero plus one, I plus one kind of thing. Okay. That's probably what they want to see. So for I in range, in range, you have zero comma, uh, the length of that list. I think LEN gives you the length of that list, right? LEN provinces, which is probably going to return four. Then um, print, then you have provinces of in index i. This is a i. Um, oh, he said the number first. So I'm guessing I would print i first. Yeah, I, yeah, you can say i then. You, but you have to print i plus one so that the user can see it as one is as opposed to zero. But that's fine. <laughs> Does he want to print the index itself or this is the first, this is the second? Yeah. The index, the index like, itself, the index oh, itself, so that we can actually okay, see what the yeah, actual yeah. number is on the list. So in future, if I have absolutely. to show someone, then I can see what absolutely. it is. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Uh, come on. Provins. Provins. Yeah. Spellings, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Tang, one in Bopo. To Pumalanga, three northwest. Does that answer mm -hmm. your question, Hugo and Jonathan? Perfect, perfect. Yes, that's exactly what I wanted. Thank you. Absolutely okay. beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. Screen grab. Uh, come on, let them screen grab before. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take pictures first. Pictures. I'm on a mission, sir. <laughs> with, with, uh, with, with an iPhone, iPhone pictures with filters. <laughs> Okay. Thank um, you very much. Okay, no problem. Okay, uh, I think we were on dictionary. Yes. So um, in this example, we're going to be doing car information. So we're going to be creating a small dictionary and then just adding different keys and values to it. So um, the key value pairs are called entries, but I'll demonstrate that now. So let's first create our empty dictionary. So how do you create the dictionary? You have your curly brackets. So how, how I remember is that lists are square brackets, tuples are round brackets, and dictionaries are curly brackets. So you are, oh, so you are creating your empty dictionary over here. Okay, so we can put car info and then our key here would be car make, for example. So this is our key, this is our key. And then we need to assign a value that key. So how would we do that? We would just, as you assign a value to a variable, that would be the same. For this example, let's just use Ford. And then we want to create another key, for example, car info, maybe the model of the car and the year. So um, we've assigned this dictionary key the value board and the car model dictionary key value ranger. So we can also include um, an integer in there. So we can say the year, for example. And then we have 2020. So just to print this dictionary, 
and so we have car make it's Ford so this this by itself is called an entry and then this before on the left of the colon is called an a key the dictionary key this would also be a dictionary key and here would also be a dictionary key and then these are our 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 values assigned to that specific key. So on the right of the colon is the values that are assigned. And then each, um, after each comma is one um, entry. So this is when we print the, um, the dictionary, the whole dictionary. But for example, let's say we want to print the, the year of the car only by itself. You can also do that. We have 2020. So let me just give you a moment to print that. Um, to screenshot, sorry. If one wants to. Okay. So on to functions. So functions are a block of code which only runs when it's called. And we can also make use of parameters in functions. So usually when working with functions, to separate our main program and space of define functions. So this is where we define our functions. So one might ask, what is the purpose of a function? Instead of having many lines of code, you can just create a function and call that function when you know that you are going to use it multiple times in your code and um, makes our code neat. And yeah, so in this example, we're going to create a function that squares number, numbers, just a simple function that we can work with. So right now, to read the user input. So in the main program, we will read our user input. An integer, please enter number squared. Okay. So we're gonna prompt the user to a number to be squared, but remember that this input is read in a string format, so we need to pass it an integer. So now we can get started with defining our function. The keyword for defining a function is def, which literally means defining a function. Um, it means define, and then um, after this keyword, we need the name of the function. So let's call our function square in, because that is what we're doing. Just like Gahito said in one, the names of our variables and functions and whatever um, objects or data structures we use need to be relevant so that when someone else is looking at your code, they can follow and understand. So this round bracket is where we put our parameters. Our parameters are the variables that we are going to use in our code. In this case, we are going to use in, which is the user input. Um, so we're gonna type in there. And then we are going to create um, calculate our calculation. So to square a number would be n times n, and then we can, and then we can return. Yeah. So um, our function is defined with the if our return sort of ends the function, and we return whatever calculation or result we want to be displayed. But now I'm sure you're asking yourself, how do we um, display the value we call this function? So we call it main program and then 
How do we do that? Can have a print and say the square is and then you can call the function. How do you call the function? The function name, exactly. And then the parameter that you use. So it's n. Yes. So let's run this. And number to be squared, let's put five. The square is 25. The square. So, um, can also can also print with a function. Um, and just call the function, and the result will be outputted. Because, for example, if I was if I call the function right now and say square n, we aren't expecting any output because we didn't print. Have no print statement. As you can. See, over here, we entered the number to be squared, but nothing was output. So another solution print the square and then return nothing. So then you wouldn't wouldn't have to print in your main program because you've already printed in your function. And there we go, F25. So let me give people a second to take screenshots. Are there any questions? Take the chat. Oh, good, Camo. Oh, good. Uh, I think pictures could. Chaka, 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 chaka. Pictures taken <laughs> already? Okay. You can continue, Camo. Thank you very much. No, so I'm, I'm done. Fantastic, Camo, fantastic. Jonathan, fantastic. Jonathan has a question, I think. Yeah, yes. Jonathan, let's go. Let's go. Yes, Jonathan. I just want to know, what does the return do in the, in the function that you just written? Mm, good question. Okay, I can take that. Um, return, so programs typically, they, they execute from top to bottom. That's how programs run. Even in object orientation, they still do top to bottom. Just that when you're in a particular place, it could be a class, it could be a method. If you want to go back to another place where it's, that place was called from, so typically you have a main program running from top to bottom, you can call a method or a function okay. or a subroutine. The languages go on and on, on how you, depending on the programming language. When you call it the transfer of execution, leaves that line to go to that your function or your method. When you get to that method or your function, you start from top to bottom again in that routine. When the keyword return is encountered, it says transfer the control of execution, return it back to where it was called from. In this case, on line uh, 15, as you can see, square n was called. So when it's called on line 15, the, transfer, the, the cont uh, control of execution goes to line six where square n is actually is. The end that was read on line 13 is supplied to line six. Then the magic happens. Like Kamua said, the, on line eight, you display the square. And then when the return keyword is struck, then the control goes back to where it was called, which is line 15. So that's a beautiful thing. It, it just allows you to terminate a function to say, we're done. Can you go back to where you were called from? Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome, okay. Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Come on. That was an exciting. If, you know, every time I feel like I'm learning this all over again, you know, that's how good this, this delivery has been. Uh, thank you very much, Kamo. I really do appreciate it. Um, boom. I think the next person for us with Emi Kaki. Kaki, so you ready? You ready to go? I'm ready, sir. Let's have some fun, Kaki. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Um, can somebody allow me to share my screen? That would be Unko Sikona. Unko Sikona, are you fine? Unko Sikona is also enjoying. I think from the chat window, she says, such an interesting session, Kamo. Unko Sikona, are you there? You good? 
I'm good, bro. Thanks. Thanks, Kamo. Thank you. Can we allow Kakiso to share? She's not a co. Is she a co-host? No, not yet. Please just make her a co-host so that she can share. Let me look at what's on the chat window now. Okay, I see a message from Mpo. Mpo is saying um, he or she and a team are part of the Akathon. I hope you guys win. I've got some great insights for you when this is done. After Kakiso, uh, your side, you might. How many minutes do you have, Kakiso, as far as schedule? Uh, uh, let me check. And Uncle Skona, can you please make Akiso um, a co-host? I think that is still not done. Just check. Or I'm missing. But she, she should be a host now. Yeah, okay. she is now. I made it. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, so as I was saying, um, Uh, okay, I'm um, seeing a question before we move on to you, Kakiso, from uh, Deliwe. Deliwe is asking, do, does it mean that we can only use tuples to access elements? Um, no, that's not true. Every data structure, that's why it's a data structure. If, you, if data is already in there, what's the point of having data you can never access? So you can access any data, be it in a list, a list of lists, in a dictionary, or even in a tuple. So I think that should be clear. You can access your data just that the way you access it is different. In a list, um, you need a square bracket. List of lists, you need two of those square brackets sitting next to each other. I think Camo demo those things. Then in a dictionary, uh, it's different. And in the top, I think the similar ways as well. I think the whole idea is to understand the algorithmic parts, to understand the logic. And when you're in the programming language, if you forget anything, you can Google it real quick and Stack Overflow will save your, your life, you know? Just, that's, the, that's the reference point, you know? However, for logic, there's no, there's no other way to get logic except to reason it out, to understand it. Then when it comes to syntax, syntax is the least of my worries. Um, I always told my students that I program in about 45 languages or more. I stopped counting after a while. But ultimately, anytime I'm programming, I just think about what do I want to do? What am I trying to say to this machine? I sketch it, I sketch it out in an algorithm. Whatever language you throw at me, I just try to see how can I translate the algorithm to that language? So it becomes a translation task. If I sometimes I just delegate it to one of my first years and they do it very well, uh, the translation task, which is the logic is already figured out. Now we just have to express it in a particular language, which is the least of your worries. So yeah. I think we do well. <laughs> yeah, I see Noto is saying the stack of flow for the win. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, boom. Kakiso, um, were you able to check how many minutes? Uh, so it's supposed to be 20. 20, yeah, 20 looks good because that way we can give um, more time to Mpo because Mpo will be doing uh, some heavy lifting towards the end. Um, so, Kaki, let's go. Lock and load. Let's have some fun. Let's go. Right. All right, guys, um, today we are going to be looking at simple problems from what Gamo was um, explaining before. We're just going to take them a bit further. So the first thing that we're going to look at is pop. Um, pop works the same as, uh, let's say, delete. It works the same as delete or the remove that uh, Gamo also showed. So let's just create our list. Let's call it my list. And in that list, let's just have hello, a string called hello, another string for world. And then let's just say hello world. I am Jonathan, for example. So how pop works. Jonathan, you just. 
Jonathan, you just made it to the examples. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> so how COP works is that um, we can call our list and say my list and then dot the pop method. And from there, we have our bracket. And in that bracket, we have to specify the index of the actual string or element that we want to pop. So if you remember from what Damu was saying is that uh, lists have indexes. So from the index from zero to whatever number would be. So in this case, we have zero being hello, one being world, and two being I am Jonathan. So let's say we want to remove world from here. In this, in these brackets, we would have to put the index of world, which in this current context is one. So we'll just say one, and then print our new list. We can run it. And now all we have is hello, I am Jonathan. So that is how pop works. And the next thing we're going to look at is append. And I think Tamu touched a bit on that. Um, but I just want to take it a bit further with append. Uh, what we learned before was that, oh, let me just, I don't know if people want to screenshot. If you want to screenshot, this is your time. Chaka, 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 chaka. It's done. Okay. So let's just look at append and use the same list. So what Kamu showed us um, before was that we can append uh, anything by just saying my list dot append and then whatever it is that we want to append. So let's just say apples again, just to refresh our memory. And then when we print my list, apples will be at the end. So let's say we want the user now to give us this information. So instead of um, just having another user input here saying wanting the user, we can actually within our list say, input, enter a name, for example. So what this line does is that it reads directly from um, the, user, the user's input. So when we run this, we'll have a prompt saying, enter a name, then we can put um, oranges, and that will append um, oranges to the end of the list. So we can do it two ways. We can do it the way that um, Gamu showed us, where we ask the user for a new input and we say new, new input equals um, this. Or we can do it like this, which would be um, more a bit better if you are working with like large uh, programs, I think this would be your best bet. So, so I have that, a question. Yes. Um, with the position of the apple or the oranges, can, can, can we, instead of it being at the, at the extreme, can it be at the middle? Can we dictate the position? Um, when you are putting it like this, like if you're just reading it in like this, you can't really uh, specify because append as a function only takes in one um, parameter. So when you're reading it in like this, no, you can't. Yeah, I think I think what uh, okay, thank you, or Kaki for that response. I think what Larry is probably thinking is in Saturn somewhere in the list. Yes, Larry. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm being telepathic now. I can read your mind. Um, I know, yes, there is an insert function that takes two parameters, uh, index that it is to be inserted in, and the, the second parameter is the item you want to insert. So there's an index, 
However, we're not trying to cover the whole list of methods. They are crazy. The list is crazy. It's a long list, all right? But yes, you're right. There are other ways to put an item somewhere in the list, in the middle, second position, 30th position, anywhere you want to put it, by indicating the position, comma, the item itself. So you're right on that one. That's possible. Also, another one, oh, quick one. Can we insert, uh, we have string now. Can we insert another data type? Like, can I insert integer? Yeah. yeah. In Python, yes. But in other languages, you might not want to try that. Your error list to be very long. The language that's strongly typed like Java or like C Sharp, you might not be able to do that. But yes, in Python, yes, you can do that. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Larry. Boom. Kaki, over to you. All right, and that's the end of append. Um, if anybody wants to take screenshots, this is your time. Chaka, 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 chaka. Done. So can I can I just confirm something? Mm -hmm. Yes, Charlotte. So 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 basically, um, uh, function append is basically appending at the end. Yes. So as it says, it's not at the front; it's just always at the end. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. at the end. And if you want to append any other position, you can use the insert function. Sure thing. Yeah, yes, yes. Good question. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, for that. All right, Jackie. Okay. So now we're going to look at sum of lists. So if you can remember what sum does is that it will just add up all the numbers that you give it from one to range that you specify or the user keeps entering um, numbers until we, we sum the whole thing. So sum of lists, what we're basically saying is we're going to sum all the items or elements or data rather in the list. So let's just take a simple list and say my list and just specify our, our own numbers. So let's just have one two, three, four, and five. From here, we then um, give our sum variable a value of zero. And then we have our for loop. So what the for loop will do is it will iterate through our list so that we can access element one, two, three, four, and then five. So for i, in my list, we can say sum plus equals i. So to just refresh our memory, what this is doing here is just saying sum equals sum plus i. So i would be whatever uh, number would be there as well. Uh, looping through the list. And then we have to remember that if we're going to want one whole sum, we have to display our print outside of the loop. If we display our print here, then it will give us a number each time we sum whatever will be in the list. So, so now we can say print that sum. And that should be 15. Sorry. Okay. There we go. So it summed up all our um, items in the list by iterating through each index and then adding it to our sum. So that is a basic um, example of sum of lists. Uh, we can ask the user to enter these. Um, these uh, data sets. So what we'll need to do is first. Thank you, sir. Can I interrupt you? And then we go to KD Boni afterwards. But for now, I just want to address the question that uh, Jonathan has. The chat window. Jonathan was asking, uh, can you undo, undo, undo? I'll go back to that previous solution. Jonathan was asking why we had sum equals zero. Beautiful question. So Jonathan, before you step into a loop, whatever happens in a loop stays there. It's like Vegas. What happens if Vegas stays in Vegas, all right? So uh, any variable you change or you define in a loop, 
as what we call local scope, meaning that the value and the, the context of that variable stays right in the loop. So if we know that this loop is meant for us to add things up together, we cannot initialize the initial um, sum to zero in the loop because every time the loop goes around, it's going to go back to zero. It forgets everything else. So the only smart way to design such a program is to initialize sum to zero first before we even step into the loop. So whatever we do in the loop, now we can add it up to that variable called sum. Make sense? Because our sum is zero before the loop starts. When we step into the loop, whatever happens, the initial zero carries on into the loop, then the updates happen in the loop. And when the loop is done, we can have an aggregated value of oh, so the that's because it adds. Up. So in the for in the for loop, it adds the current value in the list to zero. Yes, Do I understand that correctly? Absolutely, because look at line four. I is the variable that steps into every item on the list. Mm. I in my list. My list says one, two, three, four, five. So I is one at first when it loops it becomes two it goes through every item and in the loop it gets added to zero which was sum at first so sum at first is zero so one adds to it two adds to whatever the sum of the previous one is it keeps going and if you add one to five together you're going to get 15 which is what she just showed then when a loop is done like like line six then the sum of everything gets displayed but the magic is if you need a loop to do something that is aggregated, you better just get a variable outside of that loop to keep track because that variable will not change when you step into the loop. However, if you put sum equals zero in the loop, it's a disaster because every time some, the loop changes from one to three, it goes back to zero. At the end of this loop, it will just be five because if you were to put the sum in the loop, uh, equals zero in the loop, then everything disappears. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect. Uh, you, uh, can, uh, can, can you, so, uh, sorry, sorry, Prof. Can you yeah. loop, um, for example, in odd numbers or even numbers? Or Absolutely. I think that means you probably were not here yesterday. Absolutely, we can. Who am I chatting to? Who, who is uh, there? Can it's I get Charlotte. to see you? It's Charlotte. Switch your camera. Uh, Charlotte, yeah. Charlotte, just switch your camera if you, if you can. Yeah, I'm just saying. Let's see you. No, it's, it's uh, some vibe, yeah. <laughs> hey, my face is not made. Make up, piñana, whatever. Is that the excuse? No, it's not an excuse. Let, uh, another day. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. So, to your question, what's your question again? It was looping in. See, it, it, it does it have to be sequential or it can be. In it can be skipped. Yes, like yes, yes. You can have steps. You can have steps. You can have steps. However, yeah, in this example that Kakiso was given, um, it's it's a sequential one because there's a structure we call it. It's like for each. That's what we normally call it in many other languages. It steps for each item in a list. However, yesterday, if you were here, I think you probably were not here yesterday, or maybe the day before. Um, one of the ladies showed us how to skip, which is the step length. So if you go from range, you can go step length. You can go two, four, six, eight, ten, or, or three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. You can actually skip if you want to. Makes okay, sense? Sure yes, it makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much for that question as well. Boom. Kaki, let's go. Okay, so um, I see Israel has a question. So the chat window okay let me read quickly is there any reason why kaki used the underscore yes uh israel fantastic question kaki explained yesterday i think she was the one who explained it or maybe one of the other ladies explained it that sum is a predefined method in python so the keyword sum means something to the python compiler or the interpreter meaning that it's used in a way that you can just give it a list or a list of items and it adds them up together. Like in Microsoft Excel, if you're a big fan of Excel, it says sum, it takes a list of cells and it just gives you the sum. Right. So in order not to confuse that with the actual variable called sum, then I can still use an underscore to distinguish. For your own case, you can use sum one, you can use sum with two M's if you want. But Kakiso on line six, just change it 
remove the underscore line six for the sum. I just wanted to see the change in color. Immediately she removes the underscore, you can see the color is changed because now Python sees it as an actual uh, predefined function, a recognized function, and that could crash your program sometimes. So you probably don't wanna do that. You just wanna have a unique thing that's your own variable name. Yeah, Kaki, you can return it back. And give us a second to take pictures. Let's see, uh, is there another question? Uh, so my guess, uh, beauty function. Yes, Larry, you're right. So she, yeah, that's fine. Alexis says yes as well. Thank you. Israel says thank you. Then we're good to go. Uh, pictures. Chaka 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 chaka. I think yeah, that's enough. Few seconds to take pictures. Thank you so. Over to you. Right. So the next problem we're going to look at is um, what if we want to find the smallest number in a list. So let's just do that. Okay. So let's just use my list. So the first thing that we need to think about is how are we going to be able to compare these numbers to see which one is um, the smallest? So we already know that when we use comparison, we can actually use our if statement one. And two, we don't really have to read anything. So we'll just work with our if statement. So the first thing that we need to do is assign, is declare a variable and assign it to the first number or actually any number within the list so that we're able to compare the actual um, numbers to each other. So what I'm basically saying is we're going to declare a variable called smallest. And we're going to assign it to my list and just index it to zero. So this is one. Well, let's rather do this so that it's not like obvious. Let's just do this. So this right now would be n. So we know that is um, smaller, the smallest um, variable at this point. So it's like sum when we did sum equals zero, except now we're saying um, smallest equals the first um, element. And then we can go to our for loop so that we can um, iterate through the list. So you can say for i in my list. Okay. Then we're going to say if smallest is smaller than i. So if this number here, whatever number it would be at the time, is smaller than the numbers that were up, um, iterating in, then assign smallest that number. So just to go through it again, what we're doing here is we're iterating through iterating through the list so that we can go from 10, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to check each number. Our conditional statement here is saying that if this variable that we um, find so define variable is smaller than whatever number would come here as we're iterating then i want you to assign smallest to i so assign i to smallest driver Then from here, we can say <clears throat> when the loop ends, print um, smallest. Oh, no, 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 no. I need to be inside. Let me just reread this again. Yeah. 
questions for this. Yes, I think like, so with your logic, I see what you're trying to do there. Uh, I think it would have been a lot easier for you if I was on the left, you know, then you're less than would have worked, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that, that was it. I mean, on the line five, on line five, uh, that each statement, if I was less than the, um, I less than your smallest, because that is a way that's easy for people to read. Then of course you've seen this particular item in your list that's even lesser than the what you call the smallest. So that is definitely the new smallest, you know. Then that's that's where I think you yeah. So yeah, I think you can try it now. It should work perfectly well. Thank you, sir. Okay, so yeah. I got you. Um thank you. So what it's doing here is it's iterating through it, and then every time it will compare whatever number is here with the variable that we gave it. And then within here, it keeps changing the variable. So every time it goes into, um, it iterates back into the for loop, smallest does not 10 anymore. Smallest would be two or three or whatever number would be less at the time. So this is how you would do smallest. You can even do it with um, decimals. So let's put 0, 0,5 here. And it will show 0, 0,5 as the smallest. And even do it with 0, 0,02. And it will show 0, 0,002 as the smallest. So this is how um, smallest in a list works. All right. Because of time, Kaki, sorry to interrupt you and to uh, interrupt your party. I think you have been a lot of fun out there. Uh, because of time, how many most of you have to show us? Uh, three. Three, and you've not even gotten to the game yet. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I think uh, that was my fault. I probably used too much time in the beginning of the session to kind of break ice and all of those things. So that's fine, Kaki. Can you use 10 more minutes to kind of pick one of the fifth, right? I think uh, add on to greater can wait for another day. I think Factoria and Little Game seem like more exciting stuff, if you ask me. So maybe you do Factoria and let's see how much time we have left. I want to give uh, um, Paul more time. Uh, wait, wait, wait first. Let's take pictures. Pictures. Uh, make that sound, Kaki, if you can make it now. That sound <laughs> I always made. <laughs> Try, come on. How do I do that, sir? Okay, do it and then I'll. This is the sound the camera makes. Come on. Chaka. Oh. Chaka, 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 chaka. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Don't you feel alive doing that? <laughs> All right, that's great. That's great. That, that's super fun. All right. So I think everybody must have uh, taken pictures now. Uh, so Kaki, you can move to the next one. I think Kaki, let's do Factoria and Function. Um, we can spend like four or five minutes on that. I'll be taking the questions for you in the chat window. You can move super fast on this one. And then we can give more time to Paul to give us an example of machine learning, uh, data science and machine learning, yeah. Okay, okay so um, factorial. So the factorial of any number is the multiplication of all the numbers between one and that number. So if we Taking in the factorial of three, for example, it would be one times two times three. That would be the factorial of three. So that's what factorial means. So if we're going to create um, the function of, oh, let me rather start with how you actually calculate factorial with Python. So the first thing that you need to do is ask the user for inputs. So we're going to say enter the number that you want um, factorial for. And then from there, we're going to say, we're going to define our variable uh, fact, just like we did with sum, um, except here we're going to say fact equals one. The reason why we're saying that is because we're going to be multiplying um, the ranges with factorial. So if we said zero, our answer would be zero at the end because it would be one times zero and then 
zero times two or whatever. So it would be zero at the end. So what we need to do now is go into our for loop so that we can iterate through the numbers. So for i in range one and n plus one, facts, which we defined here, should be one, sorry. Facts, which we defined here, will be fact multiplied equals i, which basically means fact equals fact multiplied by i. And then- Yeah, okay, let me just, okay, let me drop in to kind of recap on one of the things that I think some of the previous, uh, I think it was Carmel mentioned as well, is that, um, the initialization on line four, you see that line for the fact equals one. In the other example, we had sum equals zero, if you all remember that. Because the operations are different. The operation in this case is multiplication. The operation in the other case was addition. So if you need an aggregation, you better add to zero. Zero will never throw away anything you add to it. You had five to zero, you're going to get five back. You had seven to that five, you're going to get 12. But if you're multiplying to a zero, you get nothing. Multiply 1,000 with a zero, you get zero. Minus 37 to a zero, you get zero. So based on the operation, that's why Kakiso has chosen to go with a one here. To say factorial, since it's a multiplication game, one never hurts the final answer. Multiply two to one, you get two back. Seven to one, you get seven back. That's a good initialization on, on line four. Then when she steps into line five and six, then she begins to multiply within the loop so that at least the multiplication value of the loop can show because the initialization is one. And I'm welcome to take questions in the chat window on that one. Um, Yaki, again, sorry for the interruption. Let's go. So now that we um, have multiplied uh, fact with the numbers that are coming in, we have to print fact outside of outside of the loop um, because we don't want it to show us as it's multiplying we just want uh, the factorial of the number so I just run it and we say the factorial of three for example will give us six the factorial of five is 120 so it will give us 120 and so on so it'll so this is how factorial works now if we had to make this a function that we can just call whenever we want we'll go back to what uh Gamu showed us when she said if to define our uh, function factorial and then we have a parameter of n because we have to take in the number um, that the user wants the factorial of then we go into our um, function and we define fact again as fact equals one. From there, we open our for loop for so i in range one and n plus one. Then we say fact equals equals i. And then we can return fact. And when we go to our main program, we ask the user again for the number. And then we print our function with the n that we're getting from the user. Let's enter a number, five is 120. So that's how it would work in a function context. Does anybody have any questions? 
Can you can you calculate the, the 120 for me? So basically you're saying one times two. Yeah. And so, then two times three. Yeah. Then three times four, then four times five. That's yeah, this is basically what we're saying. This is what's happening. So and then it gives us 120. Yeah, because it's so okay. Let's just do it here. Um, so what's happening here is fact is one initially. Fact is one. And then when we multiply it by uh, this I, we're saying this one multiplied by, at this point, it would be one as we're going in. And this is one. And then we go back into the loop, fact is still one, but I changes to two. So then it would be one times two, which is two. And then we go back into the loop and fact is now two. So we say two and I would then be three. Three, sorry, which would be six, right? And then from here, go again. And we say fact is now six and would be multiplying that six by four. So it's basically taking the sum of what we had in fact and multiplying it by the number that's next. So it's not necessarily, yeah. So it's multiplying the sum by the next number. It's not necessarily, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Sure. yeah, I think thank you Kaki, for that. Uh, is, I like the way you try to break it down. Um, I think the question was from, um, sorry, I, I failed to Charlotte. grab the name now. Uh, Charlotte, Charlotte. Okay, good, good, Charlotte. Charlotte, so one times two is three, three times three is four, is six, six times four is 24, and then that times 24 times five is 120. So, um, yeah, it is a very popular sequence in maths. Um, However, you can trace it out on pe with pen and paper. You're gonna get the same result. You know, numbers don't lie. I'm sure you know about those that phrase. Numbers don't lie, and this is just a way you can implement that in Python. Uh, I think Kaki, that's great. Kaki, do you have any other thing because time is crashing right now? Uh, so I think we can give it to him for. Um, I'll just do the game. Yeah. So if for people yeah, who want so, to the so game Kaki, outside. hold up. Let me see your next slide after this one first. Let's go right. Okay, that's where Mpo kicks in. So go yeah. back. So what we're gonna do is to leave the rest on the slide as, um, what do we call that thing? Two for the road. Now it's gets like five for the road kind of thing. All right. So everybody can have some fun with those questions. If they have problems, they can drop us emails. Now we have to go to Mpo. Mpo, take it away, fire away when you're ready. Thank you, Prof. Um, thank you, Kakisto and Kamu. Um, Good evening, everyone. No, it's not evening. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are well. Um, can the host enable me to share my screen? I will open Kosi Kona is there. Kosi, are you there? Uh, you can share. Okay, I can. Thank you. Thank you, Kosi. Okay. Um, so I'll be doing libraries for data science. So Python offers a variety of libraries and there are um, libraries uh, catered for data science that are used um, by data scientists over. So um, we have NumPy, which is numeric Python. Um, it has basic, um, algebra functions and it also has n-dimensional it offer n-dimensional arrays and then we have sampai which is a symbolic python which is offers tools for symbolic computation so it's therefore solving calculations etc and then we have um matplot library which is for data visualization so it enables you to plot your data in graphs and also correlate your your data your data sets. And then we have 
pandas and then pandas is for data manipulation and analysis and then scikit-learn is mostly used for machine learning and then there are more libraries offered for data science you can click on this link to view the other libraries that are there because there are a lot of libraries that python offers like this is only a drop in an ocean so you can go check them out when you have time so that you familiarize yourself with them so for examples um we'll be working with um i'll be showing you how to plot your data set using a matplot library and then we'll take simple examples of numpy and simpy and then at the end we'll just um explain logical regression so first things first i've been we've been announcing that um you download anaconda navigator so this is where it comes in handy so you want to open your anaconda navigator and then wait for it to load Bear with me. Okay, there you go. And then what you want to do is you want to use your All right, I think um, both before we actually hit the lines of code, I would like to know how many people here actually have this installed on their machines, guys. Please get into the chat uh, room and tell us uh, if you or you raise your hand up in the using the and raise uh, function. So let's see how many of you guys have it installed. Larry has it. Let's go. Mm, private. We've got Aaron. Aaron has it. All right. Yeah, I'm seeing doing ballistic game. I've got Takunda. I've got Israel. I've got Jonathan as well. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, let's go. I've got Charlotte as well. Let's go. Um, Thank you, Prof. Okay, you wanna launch your Jupyter notebook, and then it will open on a browser. If you choose the default browser. And for me, it's Chrome. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then you're gonna open a folder where you want to save your your files. And for me, it's documents. And then to create a new Python program, you just click on new, and then you click Python three, and then. You rename it however you want to. You rename it. But then already I have files. Okay, so we're going to start with Metplot library. Okay. You know, first things first, um, we're going to discuss the zipping and unzipping of lists because most of the time when you work with data sets, you'd want to zip them. And sometimes you would have to unzip them so that you have your X and your Y variables. So in a case of zipping, zipping just enables you to pair two um, data sets together. Let me show you an example. Let's say we have um, CFA. Okay, so we have gamma. And we have list A. And then we have list 
B, which is um, their ages, let's say 25, 34, 22. And then you can zip them like so. You say zip, you use the zip function, and then, sorry, use the zip function, and then you pass the, the list that you want to zip. So what this will do is it would pair, it will create an object that pairs um, these lists together. So what you want to do is you'd want to convert this, um, this object into a list so that you can view it. So it, it pairs them together. Sitle is paired um, with 25, Tachiso is paired with 34, Gamu is paired with, um, with 22. So this is just zipping the lists together. And if you zip uneven lists, in other words, lists that do not have the same length, what it would do, it, it would take the, it would pair using the shortest list, the list with the shortest length. So in this case, if we remove Gamu, it means that 22 won't be included in the zipping. So yeah, it will pair CK with 25, Kajasa with 34. So normally you'd want to zip um, that's a set of the same length. And then unzipping, um, you would have, let's say, we have zip data. And then to unzip, you have to specify the two variables to store the lists that will be separated. So you would have your, let's say their names, and then you'd have the age, and then you'd say zip, and then unzipping, you unzip using the asterisk, and then you call the list, you pass the list that you want to unzip. And then you would have um, print names, so it's unzipped. And then when you print the H, it's also, sorry, okay, there you go. If you print your ages, they're also unzipped. So yeah, this is unzipping and zipping. I hope it makes sense. And then now we're just gonna I'm just going to show you how to plot your graph using a Fibonacci sequence. So a Fibonacci sequence um, is one, one, two, three, five, etc. So what a Fibonacci sequence is just the current number, the current sequence is just the sum of the previous two sequences. So it starts with one and one, and then the current one would be one plus one, which is two, one plus two, which is three, two plus three, which is five, three plus five, which is eight, and then it goes on. So here we want to define the Fibonacci sequence as F at O being one, F at one being one, and F at N being F at N minus one plus F and N minus two for natural numbers. That are, in, that are an element of n greater than or equals to two. So before, you, what you'd want to do is you'd want to create a function for this so that you can be able to calculate your data points. So we have what we call a recursive, a recursive function, which is a function that calls itself within the body of the function, within its body. So what you're gonna do is we're gonna define a function called fib that will take a parameter n. And then what it would do is if n is equal to um, using the information that we've given, if f at o is one and f at one is one. So if n is equal to, sorry, is equal to zero or n is equal to one, what you want the function to do is to return one. Else, what you want it to do, you use this formula 
um, you wanted to return fib n minus one plus fib n minus two. So now you have defined your Fibonacci fu uh, function. Um, you can call it um, five. So expecting an eight. Yeah, there it is. So you know that your function is working properly. So now, yeah. Prof Bo, sorry to interrupt you. Bo. Time. Um, yes. Well, that's that's a quite a recursive algorithm, and I know that's beautiful. Uh, for the guys listening to us, please um, kind of Google recursion. All right. So I'm going to put it in the chat window. Recursion is one of those beautiful concepts in computer science for repetitive code mapping and things like that. And that's what Paul just showed you on the, the last line of code there where she said um, return fib n minus one percent minus two. But you don't worry about the concept. Uh, that's 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 recursion. So Paul. The thing is, we are tied with time, all right? On board. Time, I yes, I can now, see that. Can we skip? Can we skip board? Let's skip to your model, all right? How did you did get okay. five. Uh, that's uh, two plus three. That's why we got five. Uh, KD. Uh, and KD. and again, I'm gonna promise everyone if I get more requests from you guys by email, I set up one meeting, maybe one hour with every one of you guys after this is all done to answer some of the questions that you might have. So do not worry. Next six minutes might be the end of this event, but it's not the end of the relations. That's I have many soldiers. Uh, here today, you've only met three of them. I have many, many more soldiers behind the scene, so we can make things happen. So Mbo, over to you. Um, let's go. So, so but, Mbo, skip. Should I me. skip everything? Oh. OK. What else do you have apart from Fibonacci? Both. It's quite a lot because like here we're just um, showing how to use matplot because we're going to use matplot in a logistic regression. I already solved the re logistic regression. I just wanted to show them like how it works, like the matplot, how to plot and then how to solve equation equations and all that. All right. Then we can go to the logistic. Right. But then time is not on our side because we have five minutes. So I'm yeah. just going to skip. But, yeah. Yeah, but I got you. I got you. Bro. Yeah. So for Fibonacci, there is nothing we are plotting, yes? We are plotting, we are plotting using the data points here, Prof. Okay, good. So can you quickly show the plot? Okay, so, okay, um, what you can want to do. Go to, we can, I'm sure our friends here don't mind us going like 10 minutes uh, beyond. No. So now you wanna, you want to deep, um, find your data points. Um, so how you're going to do this is that <clears throat> you're going to define your X and then you, no, sorry, let's say data points. Um, your data points will be equals to X and then you call your Fibonacci and then you pass X. And then after that, you say for range, for X in range, because we, we're looking for N greater than or equals to zero and N less than or equals to uh, 20, it will be zero and 21. So here, what we're doing is, um, we somehow creating a zipped data set um, where we say our data points is equal to um, X. And then we say fib and we, ca we call our um, function, the Fibonacci function, and we pass the parameter as X. And then we need to find the intervals for X. So we use a for loop to do that. We say for X in range, and then we define that range. That is how you find your data points. And then now you have to define your X and your Y. So we're going to use unzipping so that you unzip the data sets so that you have um, X variables and you have your, y, your, your X intercepts and you have your Y intercepts. So this is how you do it. You're just gonna say um, zip, you unzip it. 
and then you pass your tax of points. And then now you have your data points and zip. And then what you want to do now is you want to import your matplot library. Import matplot library dot pyplot. Import it as plt. And then after that, what you want to do is you want to create a figure where you're going to draw on and you want to create the axis for those figures. So it will be, um, we'll define our figure as fig and we'll define our axis as X. And then you're gonna say plt dot figure. And then you're going to say axis for plt dot axis. And then after that, what you wanna do is um, you wanna draw your, you wanna plot your data points on your axis. So you pass in your X and your Y. Now, given that we are drawing a scatter, a scatter plot, what you wanna do is to use the O so that you show that it's a scatter plot. And then finally, what you wanna do is you want to show your graph. So yeah, this is basically how you would plot your data sets. So sometimes you don't even have to um, define your own data sets. They give you data sets and then you just unzip them or zip them if you have to, so that you can um, draw a graph. So this can work with a line. If you wanted to draw a line graph, you would use a dash instead. So that this is just how it works. So because of time, you're just gonna skip the SymPy and the NumPy and just go to the um, logistic regression example. <clears throat> and Mpo, I just as chat it in Kosikona now. We are going about 10 minutes over, all right? After the 10 minutes, I'm gonna have like a chat to everyone that's competing for the action. Give them a few hints. I've won many accounts myself. I've been out there competing every time uh, with my students. But before that time, just me as well, when I was in my student days, my studentship days, and I'll give some hints to guys on how accounts go. The guy listening to your pitch is actually a business guy most times in Accountant. It's not actually the number crushing, crunching guy. It's not the, it's not the crazy Albert Einstein scientist. You know what I'm saying? So you need to understand how to figure out what the problem is, what the solution will be, and the technique you're going to use to arrive at the solution. And if you're convincing enough, you win the act, even though there may be any other guy in the room who can crunch numbers better than you. So you must be aware of that. So, um, yeah, so we might go 10 minutes over, nine minutes now, Umbo. I move to the next stage. Like you said, I agree with you. There's no time, let's move on. Umbo. Okay. Um, okay, Log okay, regression is used to estimate the, okay, it's used to estimate the relationship between two uh, dependent variables. Uh, for linear regression, um, it estimates the relationship between scalar variables, in other words, measurable variables, like your weight and your size. So you can estimate the size of an, of an individual based on their weight and vice versa. You can uh, estimate their weight based on their size. But then in our case, we are dealing with logistic regression. Logistic regression, it estimates the relationship between um, non-scalar variables. In other words, um, non-measurable variables that are binary to better put it. In other words, they're either true or false, a one or zero, yes or no. So the, the an example that is mostly used to explain logistic regression is um, the, like, the likelihood of a person surviving the Titanic. Um, you check that using the age of an individual, their gender, 
the amount they paid for for boarding and other variables. But then um, in our case, we are checking if a, an individual, the likability of an individual at a certain age uh, buying a funeral cover. So in our case, oh, sorry, before that, um, uh, we a logistic regression has, it, its graph has a shape of a sigmatoid. So this is how, a sigmoid, sorry. So this is how it would look. So it's an S-shaped. And then anything that is here at 0 0.5, it means that when you move to the right, the, like, the likelihood of that event occurring increases. And when you move to your left, the likelihood of that event occurring decreases. So uh, one would represent like most probable and zero is uh, least probable. So in our case, we have a data set. It's a small data set. So the, um, the data set is H and if they would buy the funeral cover or not. So zero just represent that they wouldn't and then one represents that they would. So using this data set, we can estimate if a person at a certain age will buy, would buy our funeral cover or not. But then because of this data set being so little, the accuracy is not that high. So to have um, much higher accuracy, you would want to have a larger data set. So the data set is also important when it comes to predictions. So yeah, so, so this is the data set we'll be using. So first thing you want to do is you want to import the libraries. So you would import, we're going to use NumPy. So we, we import it as NP. We're going to import pandas as PD. And then we're going to input import our matplot library dot plot as plt and then the next thing you want to do is um let's run this the next thing you want to do is you want to um read in your data set so you're going to use pandas to do that and you're going to use pd dot read excel because it's an excel file and then you use r and then you put in the location so this is the location of the excel file and then you use data head data set dot head to just view your data and then fix this um okay yeah to so read in your data so this is basically your data. And then after that, um, you'd want to plot your, 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 your graph or your data sets. So we're going to use a, a scatter plot. So it would be, uh, we'll use matplot library to do that. So we use uh, plt.scatter. And then you pass in your x intercepts, which is your data set dot h and then you pass in your y intercept, which is your data set dot by, and then you're just gonna uh, use the color blue for the, for the scatter plot. And then after that, you just label your, your x um, intercept as h and you label your y intercept as um, by. And then this is, your graph. If you check, if you check the shape of this, this would, if you put a line here, it would resemble a, a sigmoid. And then that's when you can use it to predict the likelihood of, of something occurring. So the next thing you want to do, um, which is done in machine learning, is you would want to build the model or what they normally call it, you want to train the model. So you use um, a scikit um, library, scikit-learn library. So we say from sklearn dot linear model, what you want to input from that, you want to import your logistic regression because now we are checking um, the logistic regression. And then you build your model by calling it the logic 
logistic regression. And then after that, you fit your model, you fit your data sets. So, sorry. <clears throat> you say uh, model dot fit, and then you call your data set. And then if you check here for your X intercepts, you're going to use um, a 2D array. In other words, you're just going to pass your age in, in a 2D array. And then for your Y intercept, you leave it like that as data set dot by as by and then now you have uh you are building your model and then after that with the model that is built so after getting this you know that your model is built with the model that is built now you can predict the likelihood of it of a person at a certain age buying your insurance your your funeral cover so model dot predict and then you put the age. So one would represent a yes, and then a zero would represent a no. So the likelihood of a person uh, buying the insurance at the age of 80 is probable. In other words, it's high. It's possible for a person at 80 to buy the insurance. And then you can check with different ages. You can check with 26, um, the likelihood is no so it's less it's less probable and then you can check with different ages as you go on so this is basically how you can use your this is how you check your logistic regression uh, using numpy um, and pandas and matplot library and also your skitlen your size skitlen library to do that so yeah I think that's it. Fantastic, Mpo. At some point, I thought you were like a rapper because you knew you had very little time. You were going like a first of all, website. You were like rapping. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was enjoying. I was enjoying it. Mpo, fantastic job. Fantastic job. I'm. I'm also responding to our colleagues, uh, our friends, and our um, co um, co participants in the chat window. Folks are thinking we should record this part as well and make it available to them. We're going to discuss with Mukosi Kona about that and see how we can make that available. Um, I have got some philosophical stuff to share with them. Maybe in like one or two minutes before we end. Yeah, yeah. so Mukosi Kona has dropped an email address to say for more information, anything you need, all of this things she was talking about, just drop Mukosi Kona an email. Uh, she's the magic, she's, she's the, uh, king, what's it called? A King Kong, King Kong on that side that makes things happen. She's on the decision making side. Um, thank you, Charlotte. I, I really appreciate it. Um, switch to your camps again, Camo and Kaki, switch to your camps. Great teamwork. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for that comment. Um, my girls don't sleep, you know, um, Paul, Camo, Kaki, they don't sleep. These girls, uh, they're machines. This guys work very hard. Um, yeah. So that said, um, I want to share a few things about the hackathon. And guys, everyone around now, just try to switch on your cam if you can. All right. Like I said before, it's about the most convincing guy. This is the best seller. Can you sell? Hackathons are not, the time is so short that it's not about, um, it's not about, you know, being sophisticated scientifically, that's not the point. Everybody in the hackathon, are, they, they're managers. These are guys who can sign off checks to make things happen. So if you go over and above and you are, try to be super smart, then you keep talking signal functions and crazy stuff, they lose touch with you. So I think one of the best places to start is the problem that you're trying to solve. They give you a data set, you're like, these are the things I can use this data set for. These are the problems that this is can solve. And these are the techniques we can. So the technique itself, you can put in a black box, even when you cannot code. And if you have someone in your team that can write a piece of code, Larry is here, Larry can write a piece of code, I could tell. A bunch of other guys in the chat room that I've picked up over the last few days, Israel is there. A bunch of guys here can write some piece of code, kind of like try to relate to those guys and maybe form a bigger team. The team must be more on problem solving side, maybe 
and 10% on the actual technological side. You'd be so surprised how magical that is because the guys you're talking to don't actually know a lot about technology and they would have to decide who wins and who is losing. Yeah, so let me just check, uh, I think ladies, uh, thank you very much, Mandisa. Um, Mandisa, that, that means a lot. Um, Magic of uh, team. Thank you very much, Peter Lujimi, thank you very much. Hey, Bonnet, thank you very much. I do really appreciate that as well. Um, Paula, thank you very much. Um, uh, Uncle Sikona, can you get us this comment or all, all kind of, if it's screen grab those pops all kind of saved somewhere. These are very good comments. I want my 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 soldiers to have this later on to look at them. Uh, beauty and beauty. Thank you very much, Charlotte. My guests are beautiful, you can see that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Uncle Sikona, young ladies, our country is in good hands. Absolutely. Uh, the future looks very bright. Thank you very much, Uncle Sikona, for that. Um, knowledge you shared, yeah, yeah. I was also challenging some of them that if they would like to come to academia because that's where you can make massive impact. Um, thank you very much, uh, Larry. So um, guys, so going forward, that's it. I'm gonna discuss with Uncle Sikona about making the data science part into maybe another kind of module where we can actually have people enroll in it and deliver data science all by itself. Unfortunately, this time we went for Python. The whole idea is to just give you an entry level into data science towards the end of Python. Python itself is huge. People even develop web applications with Python using Django. Uh, so Python itself is very huge. And that's what we try to give you the starting point in case you want to get started. I think a bunch of you guys uh, wanted to get started. So that worked very well. For data science as an actual thing, there were three parallel sessions that were running for guys who are specializing more on that, trying to give you more insight into that. On my side, I have these three soldiers here who are looking at getting you started with Python and then giving you a very good int introduction into how can you import data, what can you do with data, what libraries are there, and all of those things. So trust me, I'm still reading the chat window. And Sipe, uh, Sipe, thank you very much, uh, Israel. Israel, thank you very much as well. Um, yeah, 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 the future is bright. Future looks bright. There's so much possibilities. It's a, lot, it's a good time to be alive. I tell people, don't want to be alive during Stone Age. It's boring. There's nothing there. Do you want to be alive during World War I, World War II, World War II, World War III? You don't want to be alive. You want to be alive at this time where it's just machines. You have a laptop in your hand and you can do so much. So it's a great time to be alive. Please appreciate the opportunity that you have to be alive and kind of wake up every day and go at it all over again. Um, <laughs> just as I wish this could happen every morning. Unfortunately, it's good not. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna invite Nko Sikona to give a final remark. Then we're gonna shake hands and this will be goodbye for now. In the chat window, Kaki Kamo, um, put your emails there, type mine in there too as well in case anybody has a follow-up question. And then Nko Sikona, Thanks, bro. Hey, 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 hey. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Absol absolutely. I'm not overwhelmed with all the information. This is, I used to hate programming, but I think I have change of heart now. <laughs> I'm going to try again. Programming is fun, actually. It's it like, is. It's it like, is. It's like playing, yeah. Oh. It is. Guys, thank you so much for attending um, this session over these three days. Please join us uh, for the hackathon. If you need more info, please email me. Those who are writing exams, all the best. And yeah, we'll see each other on the other side. Thanks, Prof, and your team. Guys, if you want to, yeah, guys, if you want to switch on your cam before it's end of the show, please yes, do we need so. to wave. Yeah, yeah, let's wave at you, eh? I'm going to play some nice uh, balcony mix here. And then you can then... Just wave, let's see you. Larry, what's up? I can see Larry there. Just for waving, yeah. Wave. <laughs> away, away, away. <laughs> let's see. Here come, guys. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank if you can Python can dance a bit. 
You say what? It's in Python. Just give us a little bit of a move. I didn't, I didn't get that. Let me pause my music. <laughs> <laughs> you said they're happy. That's you. why they're smiling. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see Sipe. I saw, I can see Kola. Um, let me just do this uh, so that uh, for the... It's like a... Like a, like a some inspiration, eh? You guys, enjoy the hackathon. Please win some money. Win some money, all right? Money is good. So even if you are not how can you will be team how can you from tomorrow. Say what? Even if you are not from Houting, from tomorrow up until Sunday, you are team Houting. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. And let's talk postgraduate degrees, whatever you're thinking about. The only sin is when you don't dream big. That's a sin, all right? You have to dream so big that your dream is almost going to swallow you. That's how you have to think about this every day when you wake up. So Python is just one thing we got the opportunity to speak to you about, but there's many things we want to speak to you about, but there's no time. All right. Boom. Salut. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm sure on behalf of the girls, I really do thank you. And I thank Nimisa as well. Boom. Thanks, guys. Bye. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you.